Welcome back to Campus Party 2013 at the Galileo stage. Our next speaker is Dr. Felix Arosa, who will be giving us a talk on cracking the codes of life. Please give a round of applause, please, for Dr. Felix. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining the talk. And uh, thank you, Angel, for inviting me to the presentation. Uh, when we, we, we talked like a month, month and a half ago, and then I was invited to campus party. I didn't know what it was. I am biochemist, molecular biologist, let's say, that working in proteins now, trying to, to know more about proteins. But uh, the thing is that, okay, I come from the Basque country in, in Spain, uh, Bilbao, for those ones that didn't visit yet. Uh, it was an industrial city, but now it has been kind of renewed. Let's say that the last 15 years it has, it has evolved, it has uh, mutated. Uh, and now we have this uh, one of the icons that is the brand new Yuganji Museum. Uh, so everybody is welcome to, to pass by. And I work in CIC Biogune. And as I said, I'm working with proteins, mass spectrometry, trying to get some of the, of the information that proteins might give us, trying to understand more how proteins work within the cell, uh, especially related to biomedicine and, and with biotechs in the, in the surroundings. So we were, we were trying to talk about, let's, okay, uh, Biology, human is curious, wants to know, wants to understand, and uh, wants to cure diseases. But for to curing something, I mean a disease, you not you you would like to understand. So then you can you can have tools or you can design a strategy to solve that problem, to solve that disease. And for that, you you need to craft some codes. You need to understand what's going on within the cell, within the organism, and. Uh, so, there are codes in biology, and many codes of life have been in the shadow for a long time. Just imagine the Greeks, very clever, very philosophical, and then starting thinking about, okay, so how does it work? And they were really in the, in the, really the past, and without knowing really uh, what was going on, but trying to understand. So, the technological improvements allowed as to push forward the research to better understand these processes. And we will see some processes that are the microscopic world uh, and the macroscopic world is quite similar. It's, it's, uh, for me, when I, when I, when I got new on how, how some of the molecular machines work, for me it was really a shock. And I will show you a few videos that will show you that we have machines that are the proteins, that are the, the three, with 3D three structures, at molecular level that are working and that they are working together and they are making small machines and these machines will allow the cells to live. So many codes, oops, many codes and processes and mechanisms have been discovered but we know that we didn't discover everything and still we need to work a lot and for that we need new technologies that will allow us to make new questions that will allow us to get new answers and then we will end up knowing more, more about biology and of course informatics is one of the driving forces and then bioinformatics is expanding in our, our fields. So all these things will allow us to know more about uh, in biomedical context more about diseases, how to cure them, but also in biotechnology to do new things. So we can imagine that these fellows some centuries ago, once that they got a device, once that they got something technologically more advanced than the single spectacle, they start with their, with their curiosity to, to check the nature. And then they, they were able to, to see the first cells. So they got really shocked, they got amazed, and we see that it has been evolving since that, our knowledge, our perception of nature, about the perception of who are we, without getting too much into the philosophical field. And then we have some pioneers that together with people that was really in the forefront of the technology was getting better microscopes, better, uh, better protocols for the tension of the, of, the, of the samples that they wanted to, to check. And for instance, in, in neuroscience, 
one of the last frontiers, I mean, uh, probably the, the, the most complex organ we have in the body is the brain. The brain has, is big, <laughs> uh, but not so only big, but it has billions of cells, and I would say that it has thousands of billions of connection among them. I'm sure that you sometimes have thought about how the, how the memory is stored. We know how the memory is stored in the, I don't know so much about that, but you, you know a lot about technology, you know how it's stored. I mean, you, there are different methods to, for storage in, but we have brain, and the brain and the biology makes a storage of memories that you have a, uh, an ancient person that is 100 years old, and he, she will, he will be able to, to sing a song that uh, started up singing when he, she was five, and he recalls, and this memory has been stored somehow in the brain, and the feelings and everything is there, and, but it has a support that is the biology. So it's really one, I mean, probably that's the final code. It's like something physical projecting to another level. We are far, far away from there, but these pioneers started to think like, what's going on? What's going on in the brain? So you see here, Ramon Cajal, who was an, uh, a Nobel Prize from Nobel laureate from Spain at the beginning of the last century. He was a good scientist, but not only that, he was an excellent drawer. And then he got the, the neurons with all the axons and, and, and the myelin. And the, so he could, he could see things, but of course, the limitation was the technology that he got. Probably he was making many, many questions in his brain, but he couldn't get the experiments because the, the technology was not there. So at the beginning, let's say that this, these pioneers, what they got is like a perception that the cell was rather simple, or at least they didn't know how complex was really the cell. And nowadays, we know that the cell is a really complex thing. We can compare it to a huge city with many, many workers, with many connections, with many, many, many types of regulation, many codes that you ha they have to fill in order to, to progressively be alive, because the cell is in contact with the exterior, but it has to be perfectly or orchestrated. It has to be somehow all under control. So now we have, let's say, the cartoons of the cells. We have the, the plant cells, and we have the, an example of mammalian cells. And those cartoons are not coming from a brilliant painter that has a lot of imagination and say, let's paint a cartoon of the cell. So we have support, the science is on, 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 on empirical basis. You, you, need, you need results, and the results have to be the same in Europe, in, in Asia, in Africa, in, in, in America. And then you get layer over layer, and then you get more information. So electron microscopy nowadays allows us to have nice pictures of the cells, and this is a picture of the chloroplast, where, uh, as you know, the, the, the light energy is converted in, in, in chemist, chemical energy. So the thing is that uh, in the books, you don't have movies. In the books, you have pictures. And since, uh, I mean, last, last century, the, 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 whatever it was teach, it was teach with books. So then you have the typical picture of a cell. But the cell is dynamic. It's all the time moving, like in a big city, nobody is static unless you're dead. And then the, 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 the cell is living, and then all has to be orchestrated, and it has some codes. So let's go, let's, let's talk a little bit about, about codes. We have, in the city, we have some, for, for driving, we have some codes. We all know, or we should respect them. And then that's why there is not a complete collapse of the city. So, so we all follow those ones, and then you can drive. OK, just imagine that you are a very intelligent, I don't know, entity, that you are in Mars, or you are in the, the moon, and you, are, you have a very good telescope, and you are, you are checking London. 
And then you say, yeah, it's rather complex, isn't it? Because there is people going backward, forward, there is cars, there are some cars with flashing lights. Okay, the flashing light car, they are allowed to go faster. Uh, but then you go, oh, wait, wait, because some flashing lights uh, cars are police and some other are, are medical doctors that are going fast. Oh, really? Yeah, but, uh, but uh, and the driver? Wow, there is a driver in the car, yes. And, and the driver is always a fast car driver. No, sometimes he's a fast car driver, but he also drives his own car. And then he is not allowed to go so, so fast. So, you know, those are codes, and the cell has those codes. The thing is that we are not, we are not able to interpret those codes, and we are looking from, from far away. So the technologies now will allow us to get closer, closer and get more tools to to get these workers, to get these people function. Once in a while you get something like this. Is this an artifact? Or is it something that you don't understand yet? And sometimes it's like, okay, you, find, you get a finding in the lab and you say, yeah, I, I cannot get it. Uh, but then you talk to a colleague or somebody, wait, 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 don't throw this, this data away because this data can fit with my other data or I can have an idea. No, we will see that there are technologies that are getting a lot of data, but it's not the same to get a lot of data than to, stay, to get information. You, you, you may have like tons of data, then you need the right question, the right interpretation to get information that is valuable. So codes and codes. So the traffic light can be ruled by an electronic device or something that is ruling the reds and so on. And you hear I got shocked that so many robotics, so many, so many things can be done and, 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 and there, is, there is a complete community exchanging information about that. And of course, in science, we, we also have communities that we exchange information about the codes of what's going on within the cell. But as, as previously said, this is perfectly orchestrated and sometimes some paths are interconnected with the others and we are getting more and more information about that. So let's, let's get some few numbers about the human cells. So there are over 200 of cell types. Um, we, we know now that 20,300 genes are coding for proteins. Um, okay, those are facts, and then we have some other facts that is like a DNA, where the information is, is code. It's like around two meters long if we put all the pieces of DNA we have within the cell, one after each other. And then you say, wow, I mean, th th there has to be a, a nice method to really compress that long wear into a really microscopical uh, envelope, which is the nucleus. And the nature has its own models to do that. So the, a cell has over 20,000 genes, but not all the genes are being expressed. It's not the same uh, a neuron or, uh, or a kidney cell or, or, or let's say, an uh, uh, epithelial cell. But at the same time, we are knowing more and more that there is no such a big difference. Of course, at the develop, different developmental stages, you will have uh, different expression, and then it will change a lot. But once that the cells are, let's say, in a human body, then they are not so different. And we will see how is that. And then, again, the, the cells are dynamic. We cannot forget that the cells are dynamic. So this is one of the codes that was cracked the last century. And most of you may be aware of this one. So we have the information that is in the genes. And sometimes what happens is that if you are not working in biology, you know these concepts, but it's like, okay, what is really a gene? A gene is, is something ethereal, so this really, how, how is it code? We will see now. And then we have three steps to, to get that information into something that really works, which is the, in general, is the protein. So we can have copies of genes, so then we have replication. From gene, we have to RNA, and the RNA, it's a molecule that is in between the gene, which is the, the, the really the, the, the place where is the information, and the protein, which is the, the actor. I'm sure that most of you or some of you have seen this. You have a cell, and the and eukaryotic cell, as we have seen, it has different compartments. We will see that the, these different compartments 
have been like a specialization of sub compartments within the cell or getting some simple, more simple uh, living organisms that they were living in, in, the, in the surroundings that are being engulfed and there is an entire endosymbiotic theory but without going too much into detail, we have different compartments that are specializing, specialized to, be, to do different things. And one is the nucleus. It's like the tongue hole. Over there, there is the information. And the information is in the DNA and is there. But of course, there are proteins in, but the proteins are expressed outside. That. There is a gate. The everything has to go through. And then the protein expression, the machinery to do the proteins are in, in the outside. So. DNA and genes. Let's, let's, let's explain it in a very simple way. Uh, so when, when the conception is done, when, when, when an, an egg and a spermatozoid mix together, they will bring information from the father and the mother 50-50. This is the typical display of our genome, of our genes. So the genome is the, the, the complete set of your genes. It's, the, it's whatever information you have in general. Because there are some other pieces of information in those, in those sub, uh, in those sub compartments of the cells, but the most of them is in here. And then you will inherit one from the father, one from the mother, 50-50. And then it depends what you have at the end, what you inherited from the spermatozoid who went in, you will get a man or woman. So we always depict it like this, but the, but this is when the DNA is super compressed. This is the really compressed mode of the DNA. So let's say that the genome is allocated in 46 volumes. So these volumes, they have chapters. And each of the chapter will be a gene. So really a gene is a double strand of DNA that has four, like four small uh, blocks. And these blocks are the AGTC and those are the letters to read out and to get the proteins. So each abecedary has 20 something letters. Uh, the informatics you play with one and zeros. And here it has four. It's a quaternary, but it's read and three by three. So three by three are giving us information. But it's a physical thing. The gene is reading out this code. So that, that, that coding was cracked during the last century. And we got known that, like in the, in the chapters, you have like once upon a time, blah, 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 blah. There was a house with, a, uh, with three peaks and there was a uh, wolf and blah, 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 and then the end. We will see that at the beginning was, the discovery was like this, once upon a time and then the end. And then you know that you will have a gene that is coding a protein. This is simplistic, but it's like this. This is a dogma, and the dogma is still, uh, is still on. The things are like this, but uh, there are many layers that are, that are discovered on top of that. So what we know is that genes encode proteins. Just a few words about the genetic code. So we know that it will be a start column once, once upon a time, and then there will be the end. So here is the... Here is the resume of, I'm sure, that tons of work done by a lot of scientists trying to crack the code of how the DNA was, was supporting that information. So we have the AUG, and if you go to AU and G, AUG, we have methionine. F always in, in mammalian, always the first amino acid. That's once upon a time. Once upon a time, there was a protein, very small, blah, blah, blah. So then it will be, it will be short chapter. Once upon a time, there was a protein that have a loop here, a loop there. It was beta barrel, and then it has a loop there. And then it was huge protein, long chapter. And then there was an end. We have a stop codons. Okay, here is UAA. UAA, stop colon. There, that is the end. You have to stop there. This comes, this has been, this has been, let's say, synthesized by a big machinery. Many proteins bulk together, working together, and with other molecules that are the RNA, the messenger, because the DNA is always in the nucleus, never comes out. It's always well captured in the tongue hole. 
uh, you don't want to lose that information. So the copies can go out. The, the master copy stays. And then you have the protein. And the protein works. So said like this, it's like, okay, you have like a, like a train with 20 different amino acids. And that's, and that's it. And then they work. Okay, they work. But how they work? Because they have a 3D structure. So this is a more modern uh, cartoon when you have the, like that section of the, of the cell and you have the nucleus and you have the DNA that has been separated. So the DNA like in this X is when it's really compacted, but you can pull it, pull it, pull it. And then there is the DNA really rapidly there. So there is a machinery that will copy to RNA and this outside the nucleus is the ribosome that is putting one amino acid after each other that eventually will get to 3D structure. We have seen a machine that is doing 3D structures. And in our laboratories, what we do, uh, or some of our colleagues do, because we, are, we, we, we broke in pieces the, the proteins to, to, to know about them. But there, there is, a, as we will see later, there is people working Cracking the code of the 3D code, there is the, the proteins have 3D structure. And those are structures from proteins that are got by a structural biology. So there is not, the, the nature is the printer there. And these molecules, so our proteins sometimes are dimers, tetramers. They can do huge complexes, as we will see. And the thing is that they are some, sometimes, or many times, they are helped by other proteins to get this folding. This folding is not by random. It's helped. It will need energy. So, the shape has a value. So, the 3D structure has a value. So, uh, talking about diseases, sometimes we all have heard about mutations. Mutation is that in the DNA, the DNA has been damaged by a chemical, chemical toxin or whatever, or by, for instance, radioactivity. Boom. The, physically, it has been broken, and then it has not been correctly repaired. The block that was there has been missed, and if it's missed, you are reading, and then one is missing, the reading frame changes, and you have a monster protein that will not be fold like the other. So then you have a problem. Then you... The, this organism might have uh, something going wrong. So the cells, they have their own mechanisms to do like Arakiri. Oh, no. Oh, that, oh, that protein, I don't like it. Uh, uh, pff, press red button. Security. Pff. And apoptosis, for, for those ones that are not in biology, is like Arakiri. They kill themselves without, because they don't want that problem to go bigger. So sometimes when the cancer comes out, is that the Arakiri mechanism... Has, has failed. And sometimes it's that the Arakiri mechanism itself has suffered a mutation and you are not able, that cell, that cell is not able to kill itself. So, talking about drugs, most of drugs, they have as a target a protein. And knowing the 3D structure of the proteins, it will be, the, the, the drug discovery will be done in a more rational way Based and uh, it will be, uh, let's say, hopefully, a faster, a faster track to to get this this new drug. So as I said, uh, starting from pioneers, you get devices that will allow you to get some information from what you observe that will allow you to understand better your your surrounding, your your what you are trying to understand. So. For instance, in our center, like in many others, uh, we have X-ray, we have electron microscopy, and we have uh, NMR, that all these techniques allow you to have the protein structure. So those devices, this is in a schematic mode, but you can infer that this is not designed by a biologist. Behind this is a lot of physics, a lot of mathematics, a lot of engineering that allow us to have in our centers really technologically advanced devices that will allow us to know the 3D structure 
And the 3D structure, put it in a context of pharmacology, put it in a context of biomedicine, can help you sometimes, and in the best of the cases, and, uh, and many of us want that, to, to get faster the track, to get a drug that will end up having cure. So, talking about cells, I already said that the, the protein, protein construction, the, pro the protein synthesis is a process that you need energy. You, you need to put energy to get these blocks uh, one after each other, to fold that. The, 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 the cell needs to move things from one side to the other. There are many activities in the cells, and these proteins need energy. So how is the energy obtained? The energy is in, obtained in this manner. We have the ATP. ATP is like a molecule that has three phosphates close together. This is not a, uh, a lesson of chemistry, but let's put uh, an example. We have a spring, and the spring, you can compress it or you can relax it. Just imagine that we have a spring that we can, com we can compress, and we need energy to do that, and then we put a clip. And then we store this, these springs with a clip. And whenever you need to rise up this thing, you need energy, and then it's like, okay, I need three springs that are clipped, I will unzip them here, and blah, 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 I need the energy to rise up this bottle. So the energy comes from the ATP. We eat, and we get energy. But how the cell makes the, the sipping of the... Because the third phosphate doesn't like too much to get close to the other two. So you have really to compress the spring. How does the cell make that? So about energy conversion, let's say at... Let's have a look about the macroscopical world. In the macroscopical world, the, the, the human, curious and good making tools, has managed to get the, the sun, evaporates the water, that rains, and you can put a dam, and you will have energy in this water, because it's the gravity pulling it down. So then, you put a turbine over there, Nice device that will allow you to get from the movement electrical energy. So what happens in nature? Very similar thing. We are not going to talk so much about how the proton is made, but just briefly, we have the food that enters. There are energy conversions that will give us the some molecules that can be oxidized. So when we breathe, it's mixing up within the cells close to this factory. This is a sub, an organelle of the cell. This is a compartment. This is the electric power of the city. We have many, of course. And then we will have a gradient that will, that will be in within these two walls, the inner and the outer space of the, of the mitochondrial. So some proteins, some protein complexes, they are huge. This one is around 45 small proteins clamped all together that are, have a mechanism that will oxidize some molecules, will pump up protons over there. And we have a lot of protons here and very few here. The protons want to cross this border. It's like the water over there. And then eventually we have a molecular turbine inside our bodies. Not one, billions and billions working. What are they doing? They are getting this ADP with two phosphates. They are getting the spring and they are pressing the spring and from, from this out is coming a spring that is pressed and this is the, the, the currency eh, as, as it was shown here. ATP is the energetic currency of the cells. You can pay many to many reactions that need to happen thanks to that. So this is like a 2D cartoon showing that there are conformational changes. And at the end, you will have that when it's open, it comes a spring that is relaxed. And then it's really a conformational change that will collapse this, this spring. And this, then it's, this is clipped. And it can be used in some other part. OK, so then you get the energy coming out. Let's have a look.
Shall we? Uh huh. Houston. Up. Is it coming? No. No. Something is going on here. I cannot make it work. It's weird. No. So it will be nice if we can see this from YouTube because you will see this rotary movement. So like in a real turbine, this proton gradient will make a m m to move the gamma subunit, which is an axe, which is not completely, uh, is not completely a, a fixed stroke, but it has a little bit bented. And this, in moving, is making these conformational changes that allows the spring to be collapsed. In, yeah. yeah, and we checked that, and, and it was working. But uh, okay, so if we cannot, it's a pity. But uh, okay. So now, if I click, it should work. It was, isn't it? Should we tap now? No, I mean, it's going. Uh, but uh, no, this is a code to really, uh, yeah, no. Okay, well, can you, can you display? Uh, yeah. Anyhow, so if you go to YouTube and then you put ATP synthase 3D rotatory, you will see this machine really with, with, with the structures obtained by X-ray that is really moving. And uh, it's a pity that we cannot see the movement, but I have the, the pictures here. So the, the, as in a turbine, it works that with the potential energy, you may get movement. But if you feed that turbine with collapsed springs with ATP, it will move. So it can, it can do the other way around. And the scientists came afterwards and said, OK, if we can do that, we can fix the head of this turbine, feed with ATP, and I will, with molecular biology, I will put an active filament to the stroke. And if this is true, this will move. So then he put a fluorophore in the tip of the active filament, and he could really record the thing moving around. So we have a a molecular turbine over there, OK? So the molecular turbine we have is similar to the ones that have the plants, is similar to the ones that have the bugs, the, the, the microbes. But knowing the details of these turbines or the structural information, you may get, as here says, some molecules that will put a a stick in this rotatory mechanism that won't allow the bug to do the ATP that is absolutely needed for living. So you might have a good antibio antibiotic in this case that it will be specific for this bug and will not stop your turbine. Okay? About, so that was about proteins, but last year there were it, it was a very nice couple of articles published in Nature where a, a group from the States showed that the DNA could be used not only as a support for, for information, but also as a Lego bricks. So they were playing around and they managed to do not only 2D, but 3D structures. So at the beginning they started, so this is a small loop of DNA. Of course, in the DNA you can put the sequence you want. And the sequence will 
provide you or will provide this brick with different physical chemical properties of repulsion, attraction, and so on. And you can play the specificity of putting, I mean, you know that the DNA is a double helix, and the double helix is because A likes to be with T and G wants to be with C. This is like in a sieve. So having all this information, and once that it has been cracked, that code, you can use that code to put it and to paint a molecular canvas. Not only that, they went forward, and like in a 3D printer, but at molecular level, at without a printing device, but mixing the right bricks, they were playing Lego, and this is the, let's say, in silico uh, shape, 3D shape that they wanted to build, and this is electron microscopy empirical picture. So it's really, really amazing what they did. And who knows what it can be done with this one? Maybe a targeted delivery of drugs or who knows? But isn't it really amazing? So talking about cells, so the cell is really, as we have seen, a really complex uh, entity. And sometimes the molecular biologists have been used, uh, using DNA, or they can use the, the proteins to understand, but the complete pictures, we are quite reductionist, and we are getting more and more reductionist because you cannot know about everything. So you get your own niche of expertise, and as I heard to someone, it's like, if the only, if the only tool you have is a, is a hammer, then everything starts getting shape of a nail. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I have this hammer, so I want to use it. Uh, and this is cool because you will be a very good uh, hammer user. But at the same time, you know that there are some other things that are not just nails. Uh, so nowadays, this systems biology wants to understand more about the codes are cracked in different fields and they want to integrate it. So if this is a representation of the, of the complexity of the cell, you have proteins, you have RNA, you have DNA, but if you, uh, it's like a... Uh, like the polyedric nature of the, of the, of the, of the reality. You, you move it a bit to say, oh, wait, but there are also metabolites. So uh, the gene can be transcribed, and then you, the transcription is a protein, but the protein works over transcripts, works over genes, and the metabolites over all of them. There is a continuous flux of information. So the omics, what the omics allow us to do is, so they allow us to, to work in a very broad and getting information of many molecules at the same time. So the first ones were the genomics, or the genomics field was one of the first ones, but then it started up once that the genomics was ongoing, then came proteomics and so on, so on, so on. So I don't know if you heard about microarrays. The microarrays allowed at the beginning to work with many, many, many thousands of transcripts of genes, and then to do comparisons between control cell, for instance, an experimental cell, or can be a disease cell. So you have in, a, in an array, you have in each of the, of the spots, you have small pieces of, of molecules that will allow you to, if it's yellow, then the molecules from the A or the B as 50-50, but if it's more reddish, there were more molecules in the, in the A type of cell. So this allows you in a very high throughput manner to get information about which of the genes are being transcribed. But once that the human genome was cracked, let's say, all by, by an international endeavor, it was the first of the genomes was read and put all together, and the release was 2001, this changed completely the, 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 the arena for, for the omics, and then the proteomics exploded, because, okay, we cracked the, the genome of the humans, but also some of some other model organisms. There is a lot of research done with these other organisms, and then some other type of experiments could be done. So, if one can think, okay, the human is really complex, you know, and it might have much more genes than some other uh, human, I mean, human beings. So Escherichia coli, that is a, I mean, it's a bacteria, has 3,500, 
but we have a worm that has around 20,000. So are we a little bit more complicated than a worm? Uh, or how, how can you measure the complexity? Of course, you cannot measure it by number of, of genes. Uh, you have a, a certain type of, I mean, a set of genes. We have seen that. But a, a set of genes may display very different forms. And we know that in, in nature. And let's imagine uh, a butterfly. We all know the metamorphosis they suffer. But we also have... Uh, we are not the same when we're born or when we die. So the proteomics has exploded because the proteins are coded by the genes, and then these translations can be now done much, much faster. And this is a cartoon inspired it in another cartoon, and I asked to a good friend of mine who is a very good driver, and it's like in the 20th century, you could do a PhD studying just a protein. A single protein was a matter of study for years. And then, nowadays, with the omics type of technology that is many things all together, you can really work with many proteins with a lot of data. And for getting all this data arranged and tackled to get information, we need a lot of informatics and bioinformatics. So the complexity of the proteome is that one genome can be translated in different... Can be, the chapter can be read in different ways. You can get some, you can skip one, one page and the chapter is slightly different. Then the wolf was not in the picture and there were only two, two pigs and not three pigs. Or the, the first house was not, it was not a straw house, it was no house, it was a camping. And it's like, is it the same uh, tale? Yes, but you have to get into the details. So details. Uh, details has the evil inside and, and now it's another code that is coming up. So we know the genetic code, but now it's, I don't know if any of you heard about epigenetics. So epigenetics is like, it's epi, it's over the genetics. And it's like there are molecules, I mean, small changes in the DNA, small changes in the proteins that will confer a specific uh, features to the proteins, to the molecules. And that is like, is boosting the complexity. So... So there are different modifications that the proteins might suffer. And, and, le, and I, I prepared this cartoon, try to explain that. So at the beginning, we have one protein that is a worker within the cell and will do a work. Then it comes a modification. And then the worker is, is working. So from here to here, if you only study the abundance of proteins, you will say, here is 1,000 relative number. Here is 1,000. Okay, this guy is not the guilty of this disease. If you don't have the right technology and the right methodology to get into the detail of this, you will never see the difference. With the genomics analysis, you will see the, the amount of molecules that are transcribed to RNA you measure, you won't see this difference. And this is active and this is inactive. This is waiting to be working. And this is, this is able to work. Okay, this can have another modification. And the modification, let's say that it's a helmet. I invented that just for the sake of the understanding. So it can be a third protein that is a little bit of pain and is pushing, I mean, getting uh, like, like kicking in the head. And it's like, okay, I go, I go from here. And then the guy leaves his working place and he still has the, the tool, but it's not working because it's not in the right place. But if you have a helmet, the guy comes to you and then you keep working. So then you have two places of I mean, that you can modulate the activity. You can modulate. It's working, but how much is working? Okay. But then you can have another third modification. And then this worker is sent to the outer part of the cell and then is working out in, in this side. So he's leaving his place of work and is working in that place. And then it's, it's, it's arranging some other things over there. But let's say that it has another modification like this and in other side, and then they can work together to workers. And then the work is done in a, in a, more f in a faster way. Wow, but that was not in the picture. That, I mean, how many workers do I have? That maybe, maybe two guys work double of the speed or even more. And then you are counting workers and you have 1,000, 1,000, but when they're working together, they work like three. And where is it set? We, in which code is it written? So we don't know that code yet. We have to crack it. 
So there are, and, and the last one that could happen, and it could happen to any of those, is like it comes another modification. And that modification is a signal for a huge complex of many proteins together that is like a protein eater. So is that the, uh, the, the, is the, the murder for the protein? It's like you, you have this sign. You have this green thing that is called the bucutin, the small molecule, and I chew you. Pa, 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 pa. I put you out of the picture. Now you are deaf, now you are not working. So just imagine how many things can go wrong. And you ha we have hundreds of modifications. So, wow, how, how this big city is working. We don't know yet. I mean, we, we, we know many things, but not the complete picture. So, for instance, in proteomics, we have protein arrays. We have mass spectrometry that we are working with that. We have antibody technology, very useful molecules that will allow us to detect in very, very small amount the proteins we have within the cells. We have the molecular and cell biology that may allow us to do franken proteins, chimeric proteins, this part of this protein, and then in a chapter I copy, I paste it, and they have chapter A and chapter B all together. And then the protein that is processed, that in a printer, is something de novo, it doesn't, doesn't exist in the nature. Wow, this is, and this is all about biotechnology. Sometimes you modify the proteins that they confer another activity or an enhanced activity that had but now has higher. Then we need, as I said, this omics needs a lot of bioinformatics. It's people that is trained on statistics, on, on really programming, because sometimes we are really overwhelmed in data. And at the end, the, 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 the future, the final picture, and then with this slide I, I end, is like in biomedicine, we want to understand better how the organs work, how the cells in each of them, and then a more holistic view, and for that we need systems biology. And of course, in biotechnology, we have different bugs, different plants that we want to know how they work to get new things. So the different omics, the genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, the mole and cell, the structural biology, allowing us to have 3D a structure of the, the bioinformatics, nanotechnology, we have seen the Lego at the, at the molecular way, I mean, uh, done in a molecular way with DNA pieces, and many other uh, many other technological advances will allow us to research uh, and hopefully to have better disease diagnosis, treatments are cure, and why not to have a better world? So thank you very much for your attention. And now if there is any question, I will try to, to answer. Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, <laughs> I got lost in the presentation. I'm not very, uh, how to say, uh, in, in biology. But anyways, what I would like to ask is, um, actually, when you show the picture of uh, once upon the time and the end, yeah. there was something before, but yeah. also something after. Like, can you tell us what is it? Sometimes it can be genes. It can be what is called junk DNA. The junk DNA is like we have a very, this string uh, is too long for having only 20,300 genes. So it's full of what the, it was called at the beginning, the junk DNA. But the junk DNA with new technology, not all the junk DNA is junk DNA because sometimes you need to put uh, genes all together and then you need a big loop that they will put the genes together so they can be transcribed at the same time. So uh, the answer is, it can be many things, and for, in the general terms, the space, non-coding space, has been described as junk, and now it's not so junk, at least not of all, all of us. And then, for instance, in bacteria, you might have the same, let's say, DNA strand, you start in, the, in, in here, and it, you have a protein, you stand in the second reading frame, you have another protein that is active, I mean, that is, that is, will work. And you have in the third, so then it's a way to read three chapters in one, I mean, in one plus two, because then you, you shift a little bit, and, and the nature has get this way to really collapse information, and you, to have three in one. And maybe you have six in one, because you can read the other way around, and if it makes, so it's really tricky, or it can be. Okay, thank you. 
And uh, yeah, I had a, maybe the request, maybe others would like to see it also. If you have an internet, would you be able to, to show us the video? Uh, can anybody help me with, uh, with the video? Because I think it's, it's, it's a nice. So if you put ATPAs and Turbin uh, in Google if, or YouTube, you will see that really the protons that is like the water is making the f driving force for that to move. So this thing is moving. And it's, as it's not a straight X, it's bented. It will confer changes in the shape of the... This, this one is, is one of them. And then how, how do we go for... So we can, you can copy maybe the hyperlink and then paste it here. But this is strange because it was working before. Okay. I'm afraid that... Uh, so very easy. You, you, I mean, then the, the point is that they have been choosing the best ones because there are many. But if you have 10 minutes, you will, you will, you will play around. And, and it's really like a turbine. So it's really funny how the, the imagination and the engineering of the, of the human being has got a turbine and the, hum, and, and, and the nature already had a turbine to provide energy to the cells. Can you copy over there? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a pity, but we, we tried before, the <laughs> and, and I promise it worked. And yet, sorry? Yeah, but yeah, let's go to YouTube. Maybe I can find it for you in YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So we are short in time, but uh, so we put... ATP synthase rota rotation. Okay, let's have a look here. Okay, this was one. So you see, I mean, this, this is a cartoon, but uh, each of the atoms that is represented over there in that molecule is based on observations from scientists using the technology I have told you. So the turbine, you see, I mean, this is really a realistic cartoon. And there is another, some other cartoons where you can see the pumping of the protons, and then they are coming out, and they are making this gamma subunit rotate and there are three and three, like in an orange, you can different pieces, and there are three alpha, three betas, and this conformation makes this spring to collapse, makes the third force phase come in, because it's really like, it doesn't like it. There are repulsion, electrostatic repulsions, and the third force phase wants to, doesn't want to be there, but the conformation changes, it's like, placa, you are there. Now you have three, and then some other proteins might use that to break it, and the, in the hydrolysis, it's like, getting the clip out, and you have the energy there. And then the other thing is that another video that I recommend you to, to, to see is the, the inner life of the cell. Also, I, I believe that in, in, in this arena where many of you have skills of uh, doing videos and so on, uh, is, I mean, the, the human is very visual. So you have uh, one, sometimes one movie is much more informative than uh, one billion of uh, words. So, let's see if I can see the other, and to go back, the other was, may I find it? So, yeah, it's a pity, I cannot find it now. But we can go here. That is also very nice. We don't, maybe we don't have time to see it all. But it's kind of... Uh so, 
So you will see those are like rep representations of molecules from, I mean, this is a cell and this is the dynamics of life. I mean, nothing is static. So unfortunately, I have to, to quit in a few seconds. But all these movements of proteins that are making the cell live will require energy, and it's coming from the ATP in the, in the neighborhood that is providing this energy to, to happen. The inner life of the cell, very, very nice video from Harvard University, I believe. And with this, I'm at my end. Thank you very much for your attention. Can I round of applause, please? For Felix. Round of applause, please.